Brilliant to be with you. Um, can I pray for us? And then we'll dive into the book of Galatians. Brilliant book of Galatians. But let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we praise you that we can call you Father. We praise you that we can gather together as family, as children, uh, adopted in the Lord Jesus, filled with your Spirit. And we pray that now, by your Spirit, you would speak with clarity, with power, with grace, that we might see in the face of Christ who you really are and who we really are. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So we've got some verses at the end of this letter that Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia, what we would call today Turkey. What did Paul think about Turkey in his day? Uh, With all kinds of political upheaval in his day, he was very concerned for the church. I wonder if we are concerned for the church in Turkey. Are our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Turkey. That was Paul's great concern. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, from these five verses, six verses from chapter six, and then we're going to zoom up to 30,000 feet and we're going to get a view of Galatians uh, because actually a lot of the terms in our verses have come beforehand in the letter. So we're going to get this overview and then we're going to dive back down into the verses. Is that okay? Let's have a look from Galatians chapter six and verse five. Paul writes, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, right here in our verses, a lot of themes are being introduced. Themes about the flesh and the spirit, about the gospel, about doing good, about freedom in Christ. And what I want to do is just zoom back to get uh, an idea from the letter about what Paul is thinking about when he's thinking about the flesh, when he's thinking about the spirit. Because unless we get his understanding of flesh and spirit, we'll totally misunderstand those verses. So let's zoom up to 30,000 feet and let's think about Galatians really as this uh, letter about freedom. Really, it's about freedom. So Galatians 5 verse 1, very famously, Paul says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't we love that verse? Don't we want to punch the air? When it says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. I wonder what images spring to mind when you think about freedom. If you were to Google search an image of freedom, I wonder what you'd find. Well, you don't have to wonder because I did that earlier in the week. And uh, here are the images. Is that what you expected? That's kind of what I expected, really, before I tapped freedom in. I You know, you've got these wide open spaces, the wide open horizon, the wide open road. You've got the wide open sea. And what do you notice about the people? If there are people in these images, what do you notice about them? They are all by themselves, aren't they? They are all on their own, enjoying freedom by themselves because you don't want to get you know, other people around you. They might get in the way of your freedom, man. You need to throw off the shackles and get alone and do what you want to do when you want to do it. Isn't that freedom? That's how we think of freedom in the West, isn't it? We think of freedom as throwing off the shackles, leaving the family home behind because, you know, those guys are losers and we're just, we're just going to head out onto the road, wind in our hair, no one can stop me now, I'm all by myself doing what I want to do when I want to do it. That's freedom, isn't it? According to the Bible, that's not freedom, that is being lost, Okay. And when you think about it, there's, there's really just a hair's breadth between getting free in that sense and getting lost. If you run away from home, pretty soon that's where you find yourself, lost. I love that there's an episode of The Simpsons, classic Simpsons, I think it was series five, you know, back in the, in the classic days, John Schwartzwelder uh, wrote this episode of Homer in Space. 
And you've maybe seen the episode, Homer somehow gets loose in zero gravity and he crashes into this ant farm. And uh, you just get to hear what the ants are chirruping to one another. There's subtitles below it. And they say, you know, quick, protect the queen. And then the other one says, which one's the queen? And then suddenly Homer crashes into the, into the ant farm and all these ants are released. They are freed. They are liberated into zero gravity. And you just get one of these ants that says, freedom, horrible, horrible freedom. Um, and that's really the Bible's sense, that, that when we are liberated from the context in which we flourish and thrive, that's not called freedom, that's called getting lost. And actually, when you leave home and you just want to get by yourself so that you can do what you want to do, when you want to do it, that's being lost, that's not being free. Um, I get this all the time. I, I get asked to speak at Freshers' Weeks in universities around the place. And Freshers' Week is a brilliant uh, time for realizing that people wanting to get free end up getting lost. Very, very lost. I mean, it happens a lot in the UK because um, in Australia, when we go away to university, we don't really go away. Most people actually stay at home when they go to university. They, they still live with their parents when they study um, because we actually like our parents in Australia. Um, over here, not so much. If you live in the south, where do you go to? You go up to the north, don't you? Because you just want to get free, right? And you can understand that. I remember my, um, my freshers' week, I came to university here in England, and I remember um, <laughs> my mother was helping me unpack my room, and we had boxes. And uh, as I unpacked the last box, and she had to drive home and leave me in student digs, um, I think she's embarrassed by what she said. I'm, I'm mortified by the words that she said. But she said to me with a tear in her eye, a single tear coming down the cheek, she said, Glenn, just fly, Glenn. Just fly. Um, and me, because sarcasm is my love language, I, I just sort of said, yes, mother, but only because you're the wind beneath my wings. Um, I know it wasn't, wasn't a good thing to say. I've regretted it ever since. This, this sarcastic teenage moment, but that's what I said. But you understand what my mum means. Just fly, just fly. And you go around these freshers weeks and you see a whole lot of people who are very excited to be free. But of course, they're all lost. Everybody's lost. You know, physically people are lost. They don't know where the library is. They don't know where the lecture theatres are. You know, after three years, they still don't know where the library is, the lecture theatres are. But, you know, and also emotionally, personally, people are lost. And you get that all the time. And, and yet, what is the wisdom of today? The wisdom of today is if you're lost, you need to find yourself, right? Isn't that the dumbest thing you've ever heard? Like, if you're lost, the last person you need to find is yourself, right? Because you're lost. <laughs> Finding a lost person is never any help. Have you ever found a lost person? They say, I'm sorry, mate, I'm lost too. So we're a bunch of lost people trying to find ourselves and when we find ourselves, we find that we are lost, which is no great find, is it? If you are lost, what do you need to find? You don't need to find yourself. If you're lost, you need to find home. And the good news of Galatians is someone from home has come to find you. And when you are home, when he brings you home, you don't have to find yourself. You can be yourself because you're home. So in Galatians chapter 4, there's this beautiful uh, verse. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. See, trying to get free, ending up lost. Trying to be liberated, ending up enslaved. But what did God do? When the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. This is the good news. The good news is here we are in all our lostness. We can't find ourselves. We can't find home. Someone from home has come to redeem us. That was the language of those verses, to redeem us. Redemption is the language of buying you out of slavery. Paying the price to free you, to liberate you. Jesus comes. He pays the price to free us, liberate us, rises up, and he says, I've taken your slavery. Now do you want my freedom? I've entered into all your lostness. Do you want to come home? And anyone who says yes to Jesus, instantly, you belong to Christ. You become united to Christ so closely that you are called in 
Jesus. We're going to see that in a second. You are in Jesus. And suddenly you get his father as your father. You get his spirit as your spirit. You get his future as your future. And you are home free. Isn't that beautiful, being home free? When, when do you ever say the phrase home free? Uh, quite often uh, students might say it when you, you, you've got revision, 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 revision. You finally sit the exam and then at some point, you know, the invigilator says pens down and somehow you manage to pry the pen from out of your gnarled fingers and you're home free, aren't you? You are home free. You're done. Done. No more examination. You can move out of revision mode. Can't you? Revision mode's a terrible thing, isn't it, if you're a student? Because you never, you never know when you've done enough. Have I revised enough subjects? I don't know. I don't know. We shall see. And then you sit the exam. But imagine you, you were guaranteed the top mark. Imagine you were guaranteed the top first. And so you put the pen down. Exam mode is over. Revision mode is over. You're home free. That is what Jesus offers to you and me. I I don't know if you've come home to Jesus or not yet. I I don't know if you're a Christian yet. I don't know if you've recognized that the whole getting free thing often just ends up getting lost. I don't know if you want Jesus. Actually, what a Christian is, is, is someone who says, look, I've got nothing to offer to Jesus. I'm not worthy of his kingdom. And yet Jesus comes and he says, of course you're not worthy. You're welcome. You are welcome. Come on home. And anyone can come. Anyone can come. You simply trust in Jesus Christ, and you get his father as your father, his spirit as your spirit, his future as your future, and you are home. Gorgeous, isn't it? Gorgeous truth. And yet, in Galatians, in in, in the, the churches in Galatia, what we see is a whole bunch of other Christian Bible teachers coming in saying, yeah, that stuff's great. All that stuff about freedom, yeah, yeah, cool, we all love that. We all love the Jesus thing. We all love that he's invited us you know, home to the feast and we can sit with Jesus at the table. We all love that. But don't you want to enter into the VIP lounge? And then we start to say, oh, the VIP, that, that sounds pretty, I didn't even know there was a VIP lounge. And then these false teachers, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's this, there's this amazing first-class Christianity that you, that you can enjoy. You've just, you've just been having economy class Christianity, okay? Wouldn't you want to get bumped up, not just to business class, but to first class Christianity? Wouldn't you want to enter the VIP lounge? And the Christians think, oh, that sounds pretty nice. What do I have to do? And, and they say, well, there's this door that you've got to go through. It's called circumcision. Okay, maybe, maybe not. That's, that's, it's not the most popular door. But if you really want to go for it, and if you really want to prove to people that you are first-class Christianity, if you want to prove to people that, then you will go through that door. And it's not just about the ritual of circumcision. It's basically saying, I am jumping in with both feet into the law of Moses. Back in the Old Testament, Moses gave 613 commandments. And I want to put myself under those 613 commandments to show that I am iron for Jesus. And so that was the offer. The offer was, yeah, sure, Christianity is great and the freedom thing is wonderful and sitting at table with Jesus, you know, that's, that's all lovely. But don't you want the VIP lounge? Don't you want to go through into first class Christianity? And the Apostle Paul writes this letter to say, don't you dare go through that door. That door is not the door to the VIP lounge. There is no VIP lounge. That door is the door out of the Christian life. So don't you dare go through that. If you are in Christ, you are as close to God as he is. And you can't get closer. If you are in Christ, then you will not be rejected. You will not be cast out. Your good deeds don't get you closer to the table. Your bad deeds don't cast you further from the table. You are in. And so the Christian life is not the life of inching towards God. It is not this ladder climbing thing. It is not about earning. You are in Christ. So don't you dare take this yoke of slavery onto yourself called the Lord. Don't you dare do that. And it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense if Christianity is about a family. You know, what, what child 
ever gets to the age of 18 and says, right, mum and dad, uh, what do I owe you for the last 18 months? Uh, I'd like to pay you back for, you know, the food, the accommodation, the taxi services. My goodness, the taxi services. That would be, that would be exorbitant just by itself. What parent then says, ah, yes, let's, let's figure out some kind of repayment schedule? What parent? That's, that's not parenting, isn't it? If you say to God, I want to repay you and I want to earn with you, you're saying, I don't want you to be my father. I want you to be my slave master. I want you to be my employer. I want you to be my, my line manager. And Paul says, Wanting to relate to God on the basis of your obedience is wanting to leave the family home. So don't ever do that. Rather, live by the Spirit. That's a big phrase that Paul keeps on using, live by the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God has always been flowing from the Father to the Son, reassuring the Son of His love and reassuring the, 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 the Son of His security and His adoption. Well, not His adoption, His natural sonship. The Spirit has always been flowing from the Father to the Son. And then the Son has been given to us so that now we have the Spirit of the Son in us. And now the Spirit keeps on flowing out to the world. And we are meant to be swept up in this movement, that by the Spirit, now that we have received Christ, we say, thank you very much, I'd like that gift, thank you, Father, thank you, I'd like the Son of God, yes, please, we are in Christ, filled with His Spirit, and now swept up into His mission out to the world. And so the Apostle Paul wants to tell us about the life of the Spirit that we now have for free, and this life of the Spirit is down and out, okay? Okay? Down, it's for down and outs. It's for spiritual down and outs like you and me. And the direction of it is down in Christ, out by the Spirit. And that is now the Christian life that you and I are a part of, which is the exact opposite of the way we naturally live. We naturally live according to the flesh. The way of the flesh is the way of up and in. Okay? We raise ourselves up, we trust in our own natural ability, we trust in our own performances, we trust in ourselves, and we gather together people who are a bit like us, and that's what the life of the flesh is. It's the utter opposite of the life of the Spirit. The Spirit is down and out, the flesh is up and in. And so Galatians 5 verse 16, oh in fact, let's, let's go to Galatians 5 first. Um, Apostle Paul says, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. This is that great flow. Paul's like, don't bother about walking through that door into first-class Christianity. And don't bother folding your arms saying, I'm never walking through that door into first-class Christianity. Just live this flow. Faith expressing itself through love. That is the life of the Spirit. It's a beautiful description of the Christian life, isn't it? Faith, receiving Christ, love, pouring Him out to the world. That is the flow. That is how we are meant to live. Faith expressing itself through love. And it is the opposite of the way of the flesh. So in Galatians 5, verse 16 to 18, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So this is the great difference between the flesh and the Spirit. And they are in conflict with one another. You are called out of up and in living, and you are called towards down and out living. And before we have a look in, in Galatians 6 at this difference between the flesh and the spirit, it's very important to say about the flesh that living by the flesh is not simply about doing the naughty things, okay? It's not simply about, I want to get drunk every night. And it's, it's, you, might, you might instantly think about that when, when you're thinking about the flesh, but the flesh could mean any number of up and in ways of living. So it could be, it could be uh, the rebellious kind of life where I'm going to raise myself up because nobody can stop me because I'm just going to be a selfish so-and-so. It could be that kind of raising yourself up. But it could be a very religious kind of raising yourself up, couldn't it? It could be like being one of the members of the circumcision sect and saying, well, look at me, look how, look how iron for Jesus I am, raised up and in me and all my little party 
we are the righteous ones. So it could, it could happen in a religious way like that. It could happen in a com- completely secular way as well. I, I mentioned uh, this morning a, a, a street in Brighton, which I came across uh, a few years ago. I was, I was shocked to kind of walk across, uh, walk across this street, and there's this yellow paint. Have you seen this yellow paint? And I thought, what's the, what's the yellow paint? Oh, it's a graph. What's, what, is, what is a graph of? Oh, it's CO2 emissions. Oh, and the residents of this street have graphed themselves and their own CO2 emissions, and they've also graphed the national average. And there's no, uh, there's no point in guessing where, whether they are on the right side or the wrong side of the national average, right? They want you to know that their carbon-free righteousness is through the roof. It is incredible. <laughs> And it's, it's up and in living, and, and, you know, not a religion in sight, right? And yet, there's a completely secular form of up and in living, right? Um, and Paul says it's a nonsense. It is what's wrong with the world. Living by the flesh is what's wrong with the world, raising ourselves up, when instead we should be receiving Christ and pouring him out to the world. So that's Paul's whole argument. And as you get to chapter 6, you start to say, well, Is there any room for effort now? And is there any room for doing good? Is this the end of effort? Is this the end of doing good? If Paul is just saying, look, you're in Christ, and the only way you could go to hell is if Christ goes to hell. Okay? That's that's pretty amazing, isn't it? You're in Christ. The only way you could go to hell is if Christ goes to hell, because you go where he goes, right? Okay, so that is incredible security to preach, isn't it? And Paul preaches it with, with great abandon, preaches this security. Well, then, is that the end of effort? Why bother if the feast is already mine? Why do good if I've already got heaven? Well, that's what these verses are all about. And what Paul is going to say is, actually, this freedom in Christ is the end of fleshly effort, and fleshly goodness, but it is the very beginning. By the Spirit, with this down and out movement, it is the very beginning of true effort and true goodness. So actually, Paul is going to establish for us true effort and true goodness. So from verse 5, Paul says from verse 6, rather, uh, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So, we've done the 30,000 feet thing, and now we've zoomed back down into these verses. And I think it's important to do that, because if you just ripped those verses out of Galatians, and you just stuck them up on a church billboard and you put an angry font to them, what would it communicate? As a man sows, so shall he reap. What does that sound like? That could sound like legalism, couldn't it? It could sound like this fleshly, religious, you know, judgment's coming, so you better build up enough good deeds, right? It could sound like that, couldn't it? As a man sows, so shall he reap. There is a reaping day, there is a harvest, there is a judgment. So you better make sure that you've planted enough good, de- good deeds in the soil so that when the harvest comes, you've got a good crop. Is that what it's saying? If it was saying that, it would be disagreeing with everything that Paul's already said in the letter. If it was saying that, it would disagree with everything that the, 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 the New Testament is on about. But it's not talking about that at all. You see, every time in the New Testament that it speaks about sowing seed, every single time, it's about preaching the gospel. The seed that you sow is the word that you proclaim. So, Matthew chapter 13, or Mark chapter 4, or Luke chapter 8, or John chapter 4, or 1 Corinthians 3, or 1 Corinthians 9, or 2 Corinthians 9, or here in Galatians 6, every single time it talks about sowing the seed, it's actually talking about preaching the gospel. And that is the whole context. So if we have the uh, verse 6 up again, so before he launches into this illustration of reaping and sowing, he gives us what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Is he talking about building up your good deeds so that you've got some insurance against the last day? Is that what he's talking about? No. 
the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. It's all about sharing all good things with gospel ministry so that you can sow the seed out into the world. That's what Paul is talking about. And, and even that, that phrase, sowing to the Spirit, that's most literally what it is. Um, the word uh, sowing to please the Spirit is not there. The word please is not there. It's sowing to the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit. And if you um, know that the uh, word for spirit in both Greek and Hebrew, the languages of the New and the Old Testament, the, language for the, the word for the Spirit is also the word for the wind. So does that give you an image in, in mind? So to the Spirit, so to the wind. I've got this image of, a, of like a dandelion with the, with the seeds. You hold it out, the wind carries the seed far and wide. And what Paul is saying is, the wind is blowing, the wind is blowing, the wind is blowing. Where's the seed? Where's the seed? How are we going to get this word of Christ out? How are we going to get this gospel out? Because the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, creates the kingdom of God. And we need that Word. We need that Word to be sown. And so what Paul is saying is, you are home free. You're utterly home free. And now you are enjoying the life of the Spirit, but that life of the Spirit is down and out. And so now there is work to be done. The Christian life is full of effort, a lot of effort. It is not full of earning. There's no earning, but there is all the effort in the world. Because now by the Spirit, we are to proclaim the word of Christ out to the nations. And it is so vital that they hear it because the nations are living the life of the flesh. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That life of the flesh is perishing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That life has no future. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Only the life of the Spirit has a future. The world needs Jesus. Really needs Jesus. So this life of the Spirit, is it the end of efforts? No, it's the beginning of true efforts. We do not strive and strain towards the kingdom, but now by the flow of the Spirit, we go out to the world and we've got a gospel to proclaim. And we must proclaim that gospel. This world is perishing. And without the word of Christ, there is no safe place for anyone to stand. So then, Paul says, if you've received any benefit from your instructors in the faith, share Every good thing you have with them. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Share every good thing you have with those who have instructed you in the faith. Now, that's more than money, isn't it? It's not less than money, but it is more than money. And it is this sense of here is this ministry where we're like farmers And as the body of Christ, we we want to get out there propagating the gospel. And, you know, and farmers need regular cash flow. They really do need regular cash flow. And so Paul is saying to each and every one of us, there is a way of switching your investments from the life of the flesh to the life of the spirit. And that's the clever thing to do, wouldn't you say? Life of the flesh has no enduring future whatsoever. What can you be in this world? Maybe a millionaire. So what? what? What can you be by the Spirit? You can, my goodness, you can propagate the gospel. You can see lives transformed for all eternity. And Paul says, switch investments. That's the clever thing to do, isn't it? If one portfolio is going down the gurgler, what do you do? You, you switch, don't you? And Paul is saying... To, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. There really are two ways to live. There really is this life of the flesh that is perishing, and only the life of the Spirit is the answer. Don't be deceived. Invest in that and strain towards this life of the Spirit with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, with blood, sweat, and tears. With effort, invest in the life of the kingdom. So what does that mean? It it means sharing all good things with those who share the faith with you. Does that mean money? Yeah, it does. And it means 
time and talents, your house, your stuff, all good things to share with those who are involved in this seed propagating gospel ministry. Share all good things with those people. And switch those investments. Don't live for the life of the flesh. Live for the life of the Spirit. Not because you're earning heaven. You cannot earn heaven. But as Martin, uh, Martin Luther said in the 16th century, he said, uh, God does not need your good deeds, but your neighbor does. And sometimes we just cling on to that first thing, don't we? Oh, God doesn't need my good deeds. Right, put my feet up. And Paul and Galatians and the entire Bible and Martin Luther and all down through church history, everyone is screaming at you. You know what? God doesn't need your good deeds. You're right, but your neighbor really does. This hell-bound world really does, really does. So switch those investments from the flesh to the spirit. Sometimes I say to students in particular, people just starting out in their careers, you've got to switch your thinking, don't you? You've totally got to switch your thinking. By the flesh, you might just think, okay, I need to totally throw myself into this career, and that will mean this kind of job, this kind of salary, and I'll live in this kind of place. And now with everything that's already been decided, I now think about, well, how much can I give to church? And where do I go to church? And, and, and you see, like you make all these decisions over here, could be according to the flesh, couldn't it? And then you try to think, well, how, how can I now give slightly from a dwindling pot over here? And... and what does it mean to switch our thinking to the life of the Spirit? It means maybe, maybe start out by thinking, well, which church do I want to really be involved with? Where can I really plug in that will propagate the gospel out to the nations? And therefore, okay, so where do I have to live? Okay, so what kind of job do I get? Okay, so what sort of salary do I accept? Do you see it's completely different? Now, it could work in a different way. It could, it could be you are called by God to be a witness in this particular career and you're going to jump with both feet into this career and give yourself to it and invest in it. Um, and that can be a wonderful and good and godly thing to do. Make sure you get good Christian brothers and sisters around you praying in that, making sure that you're still prioritizing the life of the church and the life of this spreading the seed of the gospel. But all of this calls for, for effort, which is good, isn't it? We like effort. We like a grand plan. We like a vision to unite behind. And the gospel is not the end of effort. Yes, you're secure with Christ. And now, by the Spirit, there's an adventure. There's effort. There's striving. There's blood, sweat, and tears. So, the first thing. You might think that freedom in Christ means the end of effort. No, it means the beginning of true effort. Effort in the Spirit. You might also think... That freedom in Christ is the end of goodness, the end of doing good. But apparently not, according to verse 9. Verse 9, Paul says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Before you became a Christian... You couldn't do good. Not proper good. I know that sounds shocking, doesn't it? I was reading, actually, um, Romans 3 this week. It just happened to come up in my Bible reading. And, and there in Romans 3, Paul says, there is no one who does good, not even one. Very strongly put. And you'll think, well, surely I've, I've met a lot of nice people and they, they don't happen to be Christians. And I, I've done a lot of nice things even when I wasn't a Christian. And and, and Paul is saying, yet, yeah, no, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do, but there's such a danger, isn't there, of virtue signaling. Do you know what virtue signaling is? Uh, we talk about it in social media where you, just, you, just, you, know, you write a status update that just reflects well on you and how you have all the right views about the events of today and just all painting yourself in a good light. Since we've all become our own press secretaries, we're always, you know, we're always uh, issuing these press statements and spinning our lives, and signaling our own virtue. Because if you're insecure about who you are, then you need to build yourself up. You need to have a bit of the life of the flesh. You need to build, build yourself up. It's the up and in kind of religion. 
But Paul says, no, that's not actually good. It's not actually good to live like that. You know, if I just help old grannies to cross the road just because I think it gets me a ticket to heaven, that's not really helping the grannies. That's just helping me, isn't it? It's not, it's not really good in the, in the sense that Paul is talking about. That's fleshly goodness. But Paul is now talking about not fleshly goodness by the Spirit. By the Spirit, this down and out movement, now I am able to actually do good and not care who sees it, not care if I'm getting any earthly reward or heavenly reward. Or I, can, I can just actually do good. It's the beginning of doing good. And so now by the Spirit's flow from Father to Son, from Son to us, and then from us to the world, we can flow in doing good. And I think that's why Paul in particular says, let's prioritize the household of faith. Because he's got this flow in mind, from father to son, from son to church, and from church out to the world. And he wants to make sure that we as a church family are taking care of one another. Because we can't go out to the nations and say, come on home, come home to freedom, it is wonderful here. And actually, we're not getting on well with each other. We're not looking out for each other. The world will not believe us if we say, come on home to our family and actually, they, they look and they, they see that you know, the house is dilapidated and you, you, don't, you just don't care about half the residents in the house. And If our invitation is to come home to the family, we need to make sure that the family is taken care of. And so Paul says, particularly look out for Christians. Particularly look out for Christians. because Not because we don't like the nations. Not because we're avoiding the nations, but precisely because we've been sent to the nations. Therefore, as church family, we need to support one another because we go on mission together. So Paul has this this flow, this flow that begins in eternity past from father to son, from son to church, from church out to the world. And this flow that began in eternity past actually has a future in eternity when actually we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. That there, there is this thing at the end. What's, what's this thing at the end that we get as we do good? Is it, is it for us that we do good? No, it's, it's for them. There's that saying, isn't there? You can't take it when you die. You can't take it with you when you go. Um, it's not really true, is it? You can take people with you. You can't take things with you when you go. You can't take people. You can do good in such a way as the body of Christ, as we propagate the seeds of the gospel, as we shine for Christ, so we will see people one to the family, one to freedom. It's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What a reward. What a reward to sit down at the feast with Jesus and with those who we have shared Christ with. What a reward. Peter says the same thing. 1 Peter 2 verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans. Goodness is established. This is the beginning of goodness, not the end of goodness. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There is such a potential in all. Ordinary Christian service, such a potential in ordinary Christian goodness. As we live this life of the Spirit, sowing the seeds of the gospel, it will reap a harvest in eternity. So then what is freedom? Freedom is not a solitary thing. It's not doing what I want any old time. It's not getting away from it all. That's getting lost. Freedom is the life of the Spirit. This liberated life of the Spirit is down and out. Faith and love, receiving and pouring it out. Therefore, it is serving, it is sowing, it is doing good unendingly, indefatigably. It is investing in people, loving people, doing good to people, preaching good news to people, gathering people to the feast. And one day we will sit down, billions of us from north, south, east and west, And can you believe this? Luke chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus tells us that he will have us, his servants, recline at the table and he will serve us. Isn't that astonishing? Because Jesus knows what true freedom looks like. It is the way of service, 
now and into eternity. So then, this is not the end of effort, it's the beginning of effort. Down and out effort. It is not the end of goodness, it is the beginning of goodness. True goodness by the Spirit. And we get to live it today. Hallelujah. Can I pray for us? Let me pray for us. And our Heavenly Father, we praise you so much that you have invited us into the family. We praise you for the Lord Jesus who has redeemed us, for your Spirit who fills us. We praise you for his life, the life of receiving and pouring out. Father, if we have... If we have forgotten about effort, Father, remind us. If we've forgotten about doing good, remind us. We know that we cannot inch our way towards you. We are in Christ, but we can love our neighbors. And so, Father, we pray that we would do that by the power of your Spirit. Help us. Help us to pour ourselves out, to sow the seeds of the gospel, to do good as we have opportunity that we might see the harvest in its fullness. Father, help us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.